Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to that. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, welcome to the Dolly Museum and our Coffee with a Curator event. This is a uh, program that we do on the first Wednesday of every month in the morning, and uh, we thank Cafe Gala for providing the uh, refreshments. And please feel free to continue uh, helping yourself to coffee in the back through the talk. Um, this is Coffee with a Curator, which allows us to usually use our own um, staff and invite them to talk on different aspects of Dolly's career. Uh, today we've done something a little bit different. Um, we've invited a colleague from the community, Elise Trucks, who is a professor, um, an adjunct professor at the University of Tampa. And she uh, has actually lives very close to the museum and uh, has been attending some of these and just proposed an interesting topic, which uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of, the idea of a Freud, um, Dolly, and Sherlock Holmes. So let me tell you a little bit of the least before we get started. And um, oh, and I will say that next month, I believe, which will be the first week of June, we're going to be doing a. I will be doing a presentation on Dolly and double imagery uh, in conjunction with an exhibition we'll have in the Hub Gallery. Um, Elise uh, Trox has received her MA in art history from the Court Toll Institute in London in 2009. And she received her BA from uh, Columbia University in 2007. Her special uh, specialization, her area of specialization is modern and contemporary art. And she served as the managing editor of International Street Photographer throughout the magazine's inaugural year. Um, she is, um, is lectured both locally and internationally. I know she has a great passion for um, Louise Bourgeois, and uh, which hopefully we'll be able to have her talk on in the future. But for today, she's focusing on the connection between Dolly Floyd and Sherlock Holmes. So please join me in welcoming Elise Trucks. Hi, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for attending my coffee talk this morning. I'm particularly grateful to Peter Tush and the staff here at the Dolly for inviting me to speak on a topic which is near and dear to my heart a topic that touches on crime, uh, psychoanalysis, and surrealism. Salvador Dali, Sigmund Freud, and Sherlock Holmes. Before proceeding, let me point out that the title and spirit of my talk is uh, derived from an essay uh, the Italian art uh, historian Carl Ginsburg wrote in the 1980s, entitled Morelli, Freud, and Sherlock Holmes, uh, subtitled Clues and the Scientific Method. Carlo Ginsburg essay, Carlo Ginsburg's essay, Morally Freud and Sherlock Holmes, Clues in the Scientific Method, uses uh, humor and the uncanny to illustrate a change in perspective, a paradigm shift in the late 1800s. It's a change that promotes the rational and the scientific over the irrational. Ginsburg asks us to trace the roots of the scientific method in earlier forms of conjectural knowledge. He searches for broad continuities across large historical expanses. But he also pinpoints uncanny affinities between apparently disparate areas of thought and culture that emerged abruptly in the late 19th century. Ginsburg shows how almost simultaneously the detective, the psychoanalyst, the forensic scientist, and the art connoisseur, as in the case of Morelli, Giovanni Morelli, use tiny clues to lead them to discoveries that were anything but trivial. The discipline of psychoanalysis, he wrote, is based on the hypothesis that apparently negligible details can reveal deep and significant phenomena. That inclination evident in medicine, detective work, and our criticism, criticism also resonates with the way we feel our way and play it by ear and <clears throat> While he traces the privileging of the rational of the irrational during this period, he also suggests there may be murkier processes at work, which is where I'd like to enter into this argument. <clears throat> the uh, laboratory model of um, knowledge that became dominant during this period um, is uh, 
<clears throat> basically the, the nascent of the modern scientific um, method of inquiry. Uh, and it came to be seen based, as based on, principally on experimentation, verifiable through immediate observation, repeatable observation. <clears throat> so that there was a stable and testable body of knowledge. Um, of course, um, with Dali and the paranoid critical method, which we'll talk about in a moment, perhaps some of you have already heard of through Peter's earlier um, lectures, uh, this rational model gets totally inverted. Um, whether it's, uh, whether we are at 19 Picasso Street in Vienna, Freud's famous consultation room, or at uh, 221B Baker Street in London, <clears throat> or whether we are right here in very own Dalton Boulevard, we see evidence of the tendency to examine unconsidered details, to convert the meaningless details into meaningful analysis. Uh, here in this photograph, Dolly comically evokes this process of plunging the depths into the um, nonsensical detail through the use of the deep sea diver suit. While we look at this great photograph of Dolly in his diving suit, um, <clears throat> I will read an excerpt from Freud's essay on Michelangelo's Moses, in which Freud lays out this new scientized method of analysis, a method both embraced and rejected by Dolly. Um, but I, I'd also like to point out that um, Dolly used to perform interviews in this deep sea diving suit to relate himself to uh, the psychoanalytic method. And in this case, uh, when this photograph was taken, at this particular interview, he became stuck inside of the uh, suit, <laughs> almost suffocating, and had to be cut out by medical professionals. I'm not sure if he was exaggerating that he almost uh, suffocated, but um, he certainly explains the story in that way. So here's the excerpt that I, I want to read to give you a sense of um, this problem of morality for Sherlock Holmes in the 19th century uh, method of scientized um, discovery. Long before I had, this is Freud, um, long before I had any opportunity of hearing about psychoanalysis, I learned that a Russian art connoisseur, Ivan Lermoliev, had caused a revolution in the art galleries of Europe by questioning the authorship of many pictures showing how to distinguish copies from originals with certainty, and constructing hypothetical artists for those works of art whose former authorship had been discredited. He achieved this by insisting that attention should be diverted from the general impression and formal features of a picture, and by laying stress on the significance of minor details, of things like the drawings of fingernails, of the lobe of the ear, of halos, and such unconsidered trifles, which the copyist neglects to imitate, and yet which every artist executes in his own characteristic way. I was then greatly interested to learn that the Russian pseudonym concealed the identity of the Italian physician called Morelli, who had died in 1891. It seems to me that his method of inquiry is closely related to the technique of psychoanalysis. It too is accustomed to divine secrets and conceal things from despised or unnoticed features, from the rubbish heaps, as it were, or observations. <clears throat> these figures of the 19th century, end quote, these figures of the 19th century try to make sense of the nonsensical. Dream imagery, unconsidered details, such as renderings of earlobes and fingernails. This is an example of the sort of illustrations one would find in a book on art by um, Morelli, very different from uh, books by any other art critic, even today. I'd like to set this illustration uh, against 
the less well-known moment of, um, <clears throat> of rational prowess that uh, we find in a, one of the less well-known moments of rational prowess that we find in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's famous Sherlock Holmes. The, the famous stories are of Holmes deciphering things from um, footprints, cigarette ash, etc. But this case starts uh, with the arrival of two severed ears and a parcel sent to an innocent old lady. Here's the excerpt. Here's the expert, Holmes, I'll do the work. <clears throat> Holmes was staring with singular intentness at the lady's profile. Surprise and satisfaction were both for an instant to be read upon his eager face, though when she glanced round to find out the cause of his silence, he had become as demure as ever. I, Watson, stared hard myself at her flat, grizzled hair, her trim cap, her little gilt earrings, her placid features, but I could see nothing which would account for my companion's evident excitement. Later on, Holmes explains to Watson and to the reader, uh, the lightning course of his thoughts, loses Holmes. As a medical man, you are aware, Watson, that there is no part of the human body which varies so much as the human ear. Each ear is, as a rule, quite distinctive and differs from all other, other ones. In last year's anthropological journal, you'll find two short monographs by my pen uh, upon the subject. I have therefore examined uh, the in um, <clears throat> carefully noting the anatomical particularities of the ear. Imagine my surprise then, when on looking at Miss Cushing, I perceived that the ear corresponded exactly with the female ear which had just been inspected, that is to say, the ear that he retrieved in the box. The um, matter was entirely beyond coincidence. There was the same short thing of the pinna, the same broad curve of the upper lobe, the same convolution of the Cartilage, etc. Of course, I once saw the enormous importance of the observation, and it was evident that the victim was a blood relation of, of the woman, um, and probably a very close one. The moment is quoted also, uh, again, by uh, the art historian Edgar Wind as he rec recounts the story um, <clears throat> in um, his uh, 1963 account. It comes from Doyle's 1892 fiction, The Cardboard Box, or the Cardboard Box, which contains the ear. So here we have all uh, of these um, um, 19th century trends of looking at minute details, um, listening, if you will, carefully to them to find uh, meaning in uh, the seemingly meaningless. Dolly takes this tradition and tries to subvert it, um, I, I would argue. Um, <clears throat> so this is what uh, all of this has to do with our artist in question. Dolly, as many of you likely know, associated himself strongly with unconscious prophecies, but also with the irrational rather than the rational. He called this tactical absurdity the paranoid critical method, and he wrote about it um, for the surrealist, um, for various surrealist publications. <clears throat> we'll examine the 19th century modes of seeing, the paranoid critical method, and double images here today mostly in Dolly's work, but against the, the background of uh, Freud and Holmes. Finally, I'd like to suggest that Dolly inserting himself into the larger 19th century trend of detective, connoisseur, psychoanalyst, wearing the cap of Holmes, smoking the pipe of Freud, as easily as he wore his signature mustache. We'll return to this question again. Indeed, it's out of late 19th century contraptions of um, popular visual entertainment that Dolly derived much of his work with the ambiguous double images, um, which will be part of our discussion today and in June again. 
we'll hear about it from Peter Tush. Here we see two examples of such contraptions meant to play on optical illusions. The stereo opticon and the zoetrope are just two examples among many, including perhaps um, most famously the panorama, um, which was an interior spherical space painted on the inside, um, intended to be viewed from one vantage point in the center of the room, uh, and creating a convincing false image of a landscape, an imagined landscape, for the amusement of the visitor. <clears throat> the visual culture of popular 19th century illusion is treated uh, wonderfully in Jonathan McCrary's work uh, titled Techniques of the Observer, which I highly suggest to anyone interested in the topic. <clears throat> Here, in this cover to life magazine, just a decade or so before the birth of Dolly, we see the visual world surrounding the artist from infancy. Um, so you can see that um, the double image, and this is a double image that we will see Dolly explore in his work, um, is um, <clears throat> in his cultural surround, so that uh, we clearly see the artist working through a canvas and in uh, photography along with the photographer Haltzman. Here we see Dolly playing with the double image, that uh, the double image is here that beg us to reflect on both death and uh, sensuality um, in the view of the skull and and that the component parts of the skull are formed by nubile, um, nude women. These women are notably uh, conventionally attractive and uh, appear to just surface from the paintbrush of an artist like Gustav Klimt. Um, <clears throat> as, as an aside, also note that the artist himself is uh, inserting himself uh, into the image as in white tie with a top hat. This is in uh, the late 1940s. So here he is um, imaging himself, creating this image of himself, very much as a more um, late 19th century, early 20th century dandy, slightly um, out of sync with his time period. Um, <clears throat> clutching a cane. Also notice that he is dressed, of course, and to the nines, while the female figures are, are new. Um, so he's playing with a lot of themes that come up frequently in the history of art. The dual themes of uh, sexuality and death, certainly to our topic, may remind us of the famous binary uh, delineated by Freud, that of Eros and Thanatos, the um, drives toward pleasure and death, respectively. Um, it's of course in the shadow of Freud that surrealism and arguably modernism in general that brought um, notice that the interpretation of dreams is translated into Spanish in 1924. And it's this dream imagery uh, that <clears throat> Dolly is going to famously explore initially after joining Surrealists in his famous collaboration with Louis Bunuel. Dolly and Bunuel uh, collaborate to make the avant-garde cinema classic on Chien Andalou, replete with often disturbing dream imagery. Here we see a film, uh, a film still of the moment, just prior to the most famous element of the film, when the central uh, female figure has her eyeball sliced with a straight razor which I haven't shown to you graciously. <laughs> For uh, those of you who may have had LASIK surgery, it's an unpleasant, um, unpleasant film still, so show them open prior. Uh, the act, of course, makes no sense. Um, it comes out of no logical narrative. There uh, is no real logical consequence in the flow of the film either to her eye being sliced. Uh, she reappears with both eyes intact. Uh, similarly, um, such odd bodily elements as body hair will migrate uh, throughout the film from, say, armpit to face to 
to the pubic region and back again before uh, disappearing with little or no explanation. Ants will suddenly swarm on people and objects just as suddenly as they disappear again. Dead acids will invade pianos, double pianos. Traditional symbols in art uh, become disrupted, their meanings dislocated temporarily by the absurd aspect of dream imagery. We, as the viewer, are challenged to make some sort of sense out of what amounts to nonsense, um, tactically nonsense. This brings us to a discussion of what Andre Breton will credit as Dolly's greatest contribution to surrealism, and that's the paranoia critical method. Oh, dear. Um, <clears throat> and this is the element I'd like to weigh against the trend Ginsburg sees in late 19th century methodology. In weighing this hyper-rational approach against Dolly's measured and studied irrationality, I hope to encourage you to consider whether Dali better represents the spirit of the 19th or the 20th century. Among the Surrealist group, this very question would raise um, particular problems, uh, problems which eventually would lead to Dali's dismissal, his falling out with the group of Surrealists. <clears throat> I just want to read the quotation aloud uh, in case the light, the backlighting on the screen makes it difficult. I spent the whole day seated before my easel, my eyes staring fixedly, trying to see, like a medium, like a deployment, uh, the images that would spring up in my imagination. So he's trying to use um, <clears throat> the hallucinatory uh, to disrupt the rational. It's, it's uh, a summary of the paradigm. <clears throat> Uh, clearly, this, this is an inversion of the Freudian um, psychoanalytic method, in a sense, uh, but derived from, certainly derived from Freud. Uh, <clears throat> they did have a chance to meet, um, and um, Dali would lament the fact that Freud refused to edit one of his essays on paranoia, um, which at the time was seen as part and parcel of um, delusions, delusional thinking. Um, <clears throat> and here we have a quotation um, by Dali of um, what Freud uh, would uh, contribute, uh, a reading that Freud would contribute to to his own work as an artist. Um, notice, too, that the masters that Dali uh, most cares about and looks for are people like da Vinci and Hay. This is something that's going to uh, weigh heavily on our analysis of whether he belongs critically in the 19th or 20th century. And as promised, we are now moving on to his work of double imagery. But here in this great painting that um, the stairs, uh, the three ages, we see multiple imagery. Um, <clears throat> old age, adolescence, infancy. Um, <clears throat> Put return in the moment. Um, bear in mind, though, that this is also the answer to uh, the myth of Oedipus. Um, uh, 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 his answer to the Sphinx, whose riddle is, uh, what walks on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, and uh, three in the evening, and of course it's a man, right? As an infant, uh, an adolescent, and, and um, an old man. And this, uh, of course, is a central aspect to Freud's psychosexual theories of development, the ethical crisis. To trace the um, origins of these double images, we return um, to the original landscape <coughs> of Dolly's home. We begin to see the appearance of double images in his work soon after his association with the surrealist movement. Um, 
though the most uh, pronounced date to the 1940s. Dolly famously traces these double images back to his original landscape in Cadiz, Spain, where he related that fishermen would name rocks after unusual things, as daydreamers would relate clouds to camels, weasels, or whales. As I read this brief dialogue shared between Chasers Hamlet and Polonius, I'd like you to look at this native rock of Dolly's and consider its resemblance to anything you might have seen on, say, canvas, for example. Hamlet to Polonius. Do you see yonder cloud that's almost in shape of a camel? Polonius. By the maps, and tis the camel indeed. <coughs> Methinks it's like a weasel. It is that like a weasel, or like a whale, says Hamlet. Very like a whale, says Polonius. Here, Hamlet just deploys his restless reason to the changing shape of clouds, while simultaneously poking fun with Polonius for his suggestibility. After a brief dialogue, can anyone relate the above rock to a familiar image, perhaps? or uh, a weasel. <laughs> Anything you might have seen in the work of Dolly, a whale. If you were thinking of this, I think now you can see you can see the resemblance. Um, if you saw that in the rock formation, don't worry, you're not alone. Dolly did actually draw from that particular rock uh, in creating this strange figure grouping. Um, uh, the, the profile of this uh, work from uh, 1929, which he, which makes an appearance again, famously in the central figure here, of um, the persistence of memory. It's perhaps the most well-known painting. In this light, what persists in his memory, perhaps, is the trace of these dreamlike answers. <clears throat> Um, I mentioned before I drew your attention to his, uh, to Dolly's um, <clears throat> um, favoring the um, techniques of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, we can go back even, even further than Ginsburg to the seeds of the scientific revolution uh, that really began to germinate in the Italian Renaissance. Here, with that grace of Renaissance creative minds, Vinci. Dali refers back to Vinci's words from this particular text. Um, I'm trying to find uh, Where Da Vinci asks artists to dredge unconsidered visual material for artistic production. Da Vinci goes so far as to suggest that artists should stare at splotches uh, in walls, wall paints. To um, until they sort of hallucinate scenes, and then they should reproduce those, render those in their own. From our vantage point on the side of history, this may seem like an odd suggestion for an artist um, such as Leonardo da Vinci to have made, particularly in light of some of his associations with humanism and scientific inquiry. But this battle study that we see um, by Da Vinci is derived from, um, by Da Vinci's own account, is derived from uh, these hallucinatory moments of staring blankly into clouds or stone. This, uh, it's from this. Uh, technique of sort of self-induced hypnosis and hallucination that Dolly derives his paranoid critical uh, method. <clears throat> and here we see he is really staking this claim in a title, The Conquest of the Irrational. So. <clears throat> Explains the paranoid critical activity, it's a spontaneous method of irrational knowledge that's based on the interpretive critical associations of delirious phenomena. Um, so 
So then sort of the triumph of the irrational over the rational. <clears throat> and we can see this very much at play in um, his double images. Here from his early drawings and from details, I'm going to show you <coughs> the multiple uh, images at work simultaneously in the invisible sleeping moment. Who is also, I think, vaguely reminiscent of the Sphinx um, <coughs> in her orientation uh, and upright posture. <coughs> Uh, also in the combination of uh, the lion with the human figure. But here you can see in his early drawings um, that he is taking great pains to make these images legible in more than one way. tradition of, of double images, um, but he adds multiplicity to this. Some of these you may have seen, I'll show you quickly. Um, this is a duck or bunny. Mm -hmm. Once you see one, it's hard to see it sort of the other way. Um, in some cases, it depends on orientation, for example. What do you see here? The goblet, or does anyone see faces? Yes. Exactly. Yes. When you see it inverted, um, it's easier to see the faces. Now, if I were to show you this person um, and ask you to find the goblet, you might have been hard pressed to do so. And here is a theme played on by Jasper Johns as well, which you might have seen the cop and the profile. Johns, however, uh, updates it and uses the profile of Pablo Picasso in his rendition of this illusion of the cup with two faces. <clears throat> but it's an older tradition. And again, here we see um, the young woman or the old woman, <clears throat> which dates back to the 19th century. It's almost like a Rorschach test that's been predetermined for you in a binary fashion. One or the other, you will see instead of anything that you can conjure up. So the uh, paranoid critical method developed out of the ability of the artist to perceive different images within a given configuration. So Dolly is using these uh, predetermined um, double images as a background to draw from. He's trying to make them more um, pliable in a sense, less rational than um, To make this more uh, clear, hopefully, um, perhaps more complicated. Um, Dolly recounts a story of uh, a postcard that he found of an African village that he mistook for painting by Picasso um, and really believed that it was painting by Picasso. Any um, uh, forensic uh, psychiatrist uh, today hearing the story would diagnose him certainly with <clears throat> some sort of delusional disorder, some sort of psychotic disorder, if you saw something that wasn't there, as to say, Picasso, and a postcard of an African village. Um, and the Surrealist publication, uh, Surrealism and the Service of the Revolution, in uh, December of 1931, he relates a story of the multiple interpretability of this image, whereas he saw um, a Picasso face, 
right? Uh, his friend Andre Breton saw something entirely different out of the same picture, but still not the picture of the African village. Um, as you can see, when you turn the image on its side, as perhaps it was on display when he first caught glimpse of it, it does look slightly more like a reclined head, doesn't it? And here you can see him working through this um, image in the paranoid critical visage from 1935 um, with an inset of, of the same. And now the paint on the side, right? So he's playing with these, um, this multiplication of these visual effects. been possible to obtain a double image is clearly paranoia, he says. By double image is meant such a representation of an object that is also, without the slightest physical or anatomical change, the representation of another entirely different object. The second representation being equally devoid of any deformation or abnormality betraying arrangement, says Dolly. In other words, Dolly's attempting through the use of this method to render the rational irrational. Of course, he tends to do this through a series of considerate rational tactics. Most notably, uh, rendering the visual world as it appears to the human eye through um, laborious um, application of principles such as linear perspective, <clears throat> and incredible technique of oil paint application, as evidenced here in this 1936 um, multiple image. Here you see the detail of her face. It looks uh, quite a bit like Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of battlefields, doesn't it, in the background. <clears throat> He's tipping his hat, if you will, to da Vinci's um, Call to draw on hallucinatory images. Before we move on to look at our final point, the composite image, I just want to show you this last quotation of, um, of Dolly. I believe the moment is at hand when it will be possible to systematize confusion and contribute to the total discrediting of the world of reality. Of course, any uh, systematic confusion is, um, by virtue of being systematized, not entirely <coughs> or confused. Um, this is the problem that we're going to run into when trying to categorize Dolly as a rational or irrational figure. <coughs> There's a long tradition of artists who uh, make recognizable renderings of figures through the use of unrelated, unrelated items, such as um, Archimbal Archimbaldo's famous vegetable people, <coughs> vegetable people uh, from the 16th century. Um, Certainly a verbal example of the same trend exists in the 1940 uh, rewriting of a Little Red Riding Hood story by French professor uh, H.L. Chase. Notably, this is the same year that Dali executed many of his double image paintings, uh, such as uh, Slave Market with the Bust of Voltaire and um, um, The Three Ages, which we saw a moment ago and we'll see again. Both, both of which are um, available here. Uh, Chase, H.L. Uh, Chase, if you haven't heard it, uh, tells the story of Little Red Riding Hood by substituting every word for another word, every word in the story of Little Red Riding Hood for another word in the English language that has an entirely different meaning but sounds the same um, or sounds similar and, and becomes weirdly intelligible. Its a title is by way of example, Ladle Rat Robin Hut. Little Red Riding Hood, Ladle Rat Robin Hut. <clears throat> uh, 
I'm going to run through uh, a series of images uh, detailing this work, the slave market with the disappearing cost of Voltaire, to give you a sense of the multiple images that exist here in this great work uh, that we have available to us in the flesh. And notice the date of um, 1940. So you can see that he's taking great pains to render uh, this view in multiple um, images. The obvious one, perhaps the most obvious, is that of um, a, a copy of Houdin's um, uh, bust of Voltaire. <clears throat> the best likeness that we that we have of this uh, great figure of the Enlightenment, this great rational figure. Um, <clears throat> is painted right into the, the canvas. And when we look more closely in detail, here you can see the face of Voltaire becomes a detail of Dutch women, a pair of Dutch women who share a large skirt. And in this way, the bust uh, disappears. Here he is working the same theme through again a year later, um, slightly frillier um, lace. Um, this is uh, another famous example of Dolly's foray into multiple imagery, the three ages. And you can see written into it is um, a history of painting, really, uh, dating back to the 19th century. The face of old age, formed by a woman standing in a, an opening in the wall, reminiscent of um, the woman in Mies uh, Angelus, which he works through again and again during this period. The face of adolescence is formed by a seed woman And the face of infancy is formed by another woman who seated uh, many a fishnet, sitting between a wall and a mountain. My talk is meant to be suggestive of a trend to trace um, the apotheosis of the rational uh, and the fall of the irrational in not just detective fiction, uh, fiction and um, psychoanalysis, but also in uh, art history in the 19th century. Uh, and to trace this trend through its inversion in the 20th century, the tactics of absurdity certainly resonate with Dolly and the Surrealists. But I want to suggest that Dolly, in attempting to destroy the rational by means of dislocating it to the irrational, hallucinatory, and paranoid, may be recapitulating some of these 19th century trends. Many of us today can see this in his artwork. He certainly prefers the hidden brushwork of 19th century academics, such as Aang, for example, to the looser brushwork of his contemporaries, just as he prefers to maintain focus on objective rather than non-objective or purely abstract subject matter, however multiply interpretable those images may be. So I put to you as we move into our period of questions, is Dolly more a producer of the rational or of the irrational in his art? I encourage you as you go out into the gallery as well to consider not just um, his subject matter, but also his carefully crafted persona, his incredibly well-chosen brushwork, and exacting artistic technique. Um, thank you again for your time in uh, attending this uh, coffee talk, and many, many thanks to the museum and the staff.